This video is part of the Leadership Dream Job series, where I watch documentaries about world leaders on Magellan TV and share what I learn with you. Enjoy. When you think of Caesar, you probably think of... Nope, wrong Caesar, Julius. Wrong Julius. I mean, the Roman ruler. No. Wrong Caesar and a bad stereotype. Hi, my name's Kash Patel, and I'm here to tell you everything you know about Julius Caesar is wrong. Not really. You probably know a lot of correct information about him. Like, he ruled Rome in 46 BC. His name is annoyingly difficult to spell. And he was the first example of a modern dictator. Other words for emperor, like czar and kaiser, are actually derived from the word Caesar. But I'm also going to drop some new information on you, probably dispelling a lot of the myths that you have about him. Like, he's not actually associated with any salads, drinks, or restaurants. Those are different guys named Julius or Caesar. And his famous last words and his very Shakespearean death? Ete brute. We're not actually his. Again, that was a different guy. I know! Mind blow. But don't worry, there are a lot of other ways that JC still influenced modern culture outside of politics, like the book industry, time, fashion, and medicine. Before we continue, if you're interested in learning more about Julius Caesar, I highly recommend watching Julius Caesar and Mary Beard on Magellan TV. In my video, I'll share some of my favorite clips with expert Mary Beard, as well as inserting my own information. Okay, now back to me. Here are four ways Julius Caesar changed his society and ours in the arts and sciences. <laughs> JC had some writing chops. He actually wrote a bunch of books detailing about his conquest while he was still governor. The idea was to provide an account of what he was doing back to the Roman Senate. At least, that's what he wanted you to think. Caesar's writings didn't just record events. His accounts cast him as a Roman hero, a kind of soldier adventurer. And that's where their true purpose comes in. They are propaganda. Those accounts actually make pretty odd reading now. Because he didn't write, I did this, and then I did that, and then I did the other. What he wrote was, Caesar did this, and then Caesar did that. Now, that could be because he was frightfully pompous, but much more likely is he wrote this stuff to be read out in Rome, directly to the Roman people, by one of his staff when he was hundreds of miles away. Caesar also wanted to impress the craftsmen and the wage workers who weren't very literate, so he made the language in his books very simple and direct. Unlike other authors at that time who used a lot of flowery language and embellishments, commoners could actually understand what Julius Caesar was saying. And he made it pretty exciting. <coughs> Caesar saw that the rest of the men were slowing down. I have no idea what a Roman accent sounds like. He called out to the centurions by name and shouted encouragement to the rest of the men, whom he ordered to advance and to open up their ranks so they could more effectively use their swords. End scene. Historians say Julius Caesar also had the original campaign book, which is still used today. Months before someone is about to run for office nowadays, they'll put out a book to help get people to like them and get to know them. But Julius Caesar was probably the best at this because he was such a good writer. And, well, there was no fact checking. Number two, time. Does anyone know what time it is? It's time to praise Caesar. A year is defined as the amount of time it takes for the earth to revolve around the sun. But it wasn't always like that. Before Caesar, a year was actually 355 days and was based on the phases of the moon. But that was pretty inconsistent in lining up with the seasons year after year. The problem was they were pretty hopeless at doing the calculations. So the months of the calendar got increasingly out of sync with the natural seasons. What I mean 
is that it would be what you thought was September and you'd want to celebrate your harvest festival, but the vines would only just be coming into leaf. Or it would be in the middle of apparently wintry December and there'd be bunches of grapes all over the vineyard. Caesar solved this. Caesar hired an astronomer and mathematician from Alexandria called Sausagenius, or as I like to call him, Saucy Jeans. He calculated that they needed to extend the year to 365.25 days. And he moved January 1st so it was in line with winter. They called this the Julian calendar. The advent of the Julian calendar is when we started to actually accurately keep track of dates. And ironically enough, one of the dates that historians are certain of is Caesar's assassination. Ete brute. Most people don't use the Julian calendar today. It actually ended up being 11 minutes too long each year. And that added up where the days started to misalign with the solstices. Today, we used the Gregorian calendar, which adjusted for the extra time and was based off of the Julian calendar. While matching up the year with the sun and actually using real calculations was extremely useful, Julius Caesar didn't reinvent the calendar because he liked science. Caesar did it more to make his mark on society, which is why he put his face on money, and why July is named after him, and why frat boys everywhere quote him at their toga parties. Speaking of togas, eh, close enough, we're on a budget. Number three, fashion. Julius Caesar was known as a fashion conscious dandy. He wore a lot of loose fitting clothes and was called feminine because that's what a lot of the women wore at that time. Men traditionally wore a lot tighter clothing. Conservatives hated his style but a lot of other Roman nobles liked it and actually copied him. Some say he wore loose-fitting clothing because he wanted to appear too busy and important to think about fashion. When in reality, looking that carefree actually takes a lot of effort. Don't believe me? Just ask Lady Gaga. Caesar was also called vain because he was self-conscious about his looks. He actually made very intentional moves to hide his baldness. Like countless men over the last 2,000 years, he became a master of the comb over. But he had other tricks up his sleeve. When he was granted the right to wear a laurel wreath on any occasion he fancied, Caesar was absolutely delighted. Not so much because it was a very special honor, but because it allowed him to cover up that bald patch. He also wore high top boots because he wanted to hide his unsightly veins on his calves. That's when people should have been calling him vain. Get it? Get it? Get it? Yes. Number four, medicine. Many people think that the cesarean section was named after Caesar because he was born through a C-section. Nope. There's actually a lot of evidence saying that Caesar wasn't born through a C-section. For one, C-sections were reserved for moms who were dying and they wanted to save the baby. But Caesar's mom was alive into his adulthood. In reality, a lot of people think that the C-section was actually derived from a Latin word meaning to cut. In terms of actual stuff that Caesar did for the medical field, some history papers say that he granted Roman citizenship to physicians. This helped increase their social standing and dignity in society. He wanted to increase the number of surgeons in the army that could then help manage wounds. This could actually be seen as planting the seeds to bring doctors into the army. After Caesar was assassinated, his great nephew and successor, Augustus, did the same thing and actually formalized a little more of an army medical service. Well, there you go four ways that Julius Caesar influenced the arts and sciences. Thank you for joining me and Mary Beard. Baby, vidi, viki. I came, I saw, I conquered. Vale! If you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel for more discussions about famous figures around the world with Magellan TV.